This Relag Radio podcast is brought to you by Economics. Everyone has questions about their farm. From general inquiries to in-depth fertilizer questions, find straightforward answers at Nutrien-Economics.com. It's time for Real Ag Radio on Rural Radio Channel 147 on Sirius XM. Real Ag Radio and RealAgCulture.com is your home for insight and analysis of the issues that are impacting your farm business. Let's get real and get connected with Real Ag Radio. Welcome to Real Ag Radio here on Rural Radio 147, Sirius XM. Sean Haney, your host here on this Friday edition of the show. Hey, thanks so much for making Real Ag Radio and Rural Radio 147 a big part of your workday. And a big shout out to everybody else listening out there on the Real Ag Radio podcast. Well, this has been a busy week from a news cycle perspective. There's a lot happening in the U.S., and in Canada, we've got Bill C-234 to talk about. There was some drama in the Senate yesterday. We've got a new private member's bill from Cody Blois uh, of the Liberal Party from King's Haunts in Nova Scotia, trying to expedite and speed up some products being able to be registered in Canada across different parts of the agricultural industry. That and a whole lot more. Today's Real Ag Issues panel is going to be uh, filled by Lindsay Smith and Kelvin Hepner of Real Agriculture, as well as Tyler McCann. He's Managing Director of CAPI. And we will be joined by Cody Blois uh, for a couple segments. He uh, brought forward that private member's bill this week, and he's going to speak to it, the why of it. And uh, we'll press him on a number of different issues as well while he is here. If you have any feedback on today's show, we'd love to hear from you. We're going to be jam-packed, lots of different topics today. You can send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com. You can also find us across all the different social media platforms. You can also call the Real Ag Feedback Line. The number is 855-776-6147. Let's take a break. And when we come back, we're going to bring in the panel, and then we are going to roll through the topics. We'll be right back right after this. As a grower, you spend a lot of time focused on the details. And sometimes it's only after harvest that you can step back and see the bigger picture. At AGI, we spend a lot of time focused on details too, making sure you can store your grain how you need to and move it when you need to. Learn more at aggrowth.com. Johnson at wheatpeat realagriculture.com. I'm the host of the word and I love doing the word. I love the questions. I love the challenges. I love having to apply agronomics to all over the globe and areas outside of my normal jurisdiction. Also, I love the feedback the most where growers challenge me, tell me about their plot results, help me to learn the word. Absolutely the best part of my day. Boron is an essential micronutrient for plant growth, and without boron, your crops can't absorb the macronutrients they need for higher yields. Although borates occur naturally, boron deficiency is a common soil problem. Whether in direct soil application, through fertigation, or as a foliar spray, U.S. Borax has the right refined product for your crops. U.S. Borax products are specifically formulated to combine with other fertilizers, lowering your application costs. Learn more at borax.com slash egg. Okay, friends and kids and everybody alike, let's uh, get rolling here with the Real Ag Issues panel. We have a lot to discuss. We've got a big panel today because there's so many topics. Listen, your co-op grow team stays up to date with the latest research and technology to help support your entire operation. Talk to our team for advice tailored to your farm's needs. Co-op, here for your farm, here for your family. Learn more at coop.crs slash farm. Okay, uh, let's get uh, everybody introduced here. First up, it is Kelvin Heppner coming out of Altona, Manitoba. Kelvin, we spent the week together. It's great to see you again. Yeah, likewise. Just saw you yesterday in Saskatoon and uh, spent the nine-hour drive yesterday catching up on everything that's been happening in, in news, politics, and global affairs around the world. So lots to talk about today. Looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah, we were going kind of back and forth. Uh, also, uh, Lindsay Smith, uh, editor of realagriculture.com. Lindsay, great to see you again as well. Yes, it's been uh, 
less than 24 hours. I miss you just terribly. Really. Terribly? Yeah. Yeah. So much. You're... Anyway, my voice is almost back, but not quite. It sounds a little worse than yesterday, to be honest. Thank you. That's yeah, okay, great. Good. I, that's, I appreciate that. Of sleep. You got home at like 2.30 in the morning yeah. and mm -hmm. probably had to do a bunch of chores this morning. So uh, yeah. uh, Lindsay is sponsored by Monster Energy Drink here today. Uh, also joining us, it is the Managing Director at Cappy. It is Tyler McCann. Tyler, welcome back to the show. Thanks, Sean. Sounds like I missed out on a good time in Saskatoon. Oh, well, like one would always have in Saskatoon. That's yes, right. uh, we had a really, really good meeting this week. It was a lot of fun and connecting with the entire team, uh, making a bunch of plans for the winter. And uh, yeah, it's going to we, we got lots of stuff in the, a lot of projects on the go here. We're looking forward to uh, the winter months ahead. Also joining us today on the panel, it is a liberal MP from King Hans, Nova Scotia. He is uh, Mr. Cody Blois. Cody, hey, great Sean. to have you here. Great to be back on the show. Absolutely. Great to have you. Okay, uh, Cody, we brought you in yesterday, or Wednesday. You brought forward uh, Private Member's Bill C-359. This is uh, an act to amend the Feeds Act, Seeds Act, and the Pest Control Products Act. What are you trying to accomplish with this Private Member's Bill? So, look, the conversations, uh, I've had the privilege of being a member of parliament for almost four years ago, or four years now, and uh, what I would say is the conversations first started with my apple farmers in the Annapolis Valley who would uh, quite consistently lament at the fact that crop protection products that were available in the United States uh, were not always available in Canada. And even where there was some symmetry, there was usually three or four years difference between the time that the tools became available in the United States for when they became available in Canada. And of course, just more broadly, having had the opportunity to speak to agriculture producers across the country, it's not just apple farmers, uh, it's across the entire industry. And that's not to suggest that uh, we don't have good regulatory agencies, it's not that they don't do good science, but how can we build upon making sure that we can expedite processes more quickly without compromising public safety? And so what the bill calls for, Sean, is essentially the ability for Health Canada, CFIA, or PMRA to establish what a trusted jurisdiction is. Now, that's not my job to say what that is, but you can imagine uh, whether or not it's the United States. If we know there's approval there, we know that there was strong science and, and you know, a robust, robust process that was used. You can think about the European Union, Australia, United Kingdom, for example. Essentially, the agency could de determine what a trusted jurisdiction is. And if an applicant were to arrive in Canada with at least two trusted jurisdictions already approved, there would be a 90-day provisional registration. Now, what I think would happen, Sean, to... Uh, to, to try to provide further clarity is an applicant could apply under a 90-day provisional registration. If they were approved, then the farmers would have access to these tools. We would still go through the regular normal process, but you can close that gap, which is sometimes two and a half, three years to 90 days. And if there was a reason during the full regulatory review that there was a need to put a put up our hand and say look we got to put a red flag on this you could pause the provisional registration but otherwise uh, look if something comes and already has approval from us europe australia the chances of it not being approved in canada are quite low and we need to be able to use the science from other jurisdictions that we trust to focus on canadian competitiveness in our agriculture sector Cody, I, I don't know what you're doing in Ottawa. You are showcasing way too much common sense here. Uh, let's uh, get to our panel's uh, questions. Uh, Kelvin, you want to go first? Sure, Cody, you mentioned apple growers. Uh, we've been hearing for a few years about uh, a feed additive that beef producers could use to reduce methane emissions from, from cattle. Is that another example of a product that would fit into uh, into this uh, this change that you're making or hoping yeah. to make? Yeah, absolutely. So um, I think it's DSM and the three NOP, which you're referencing. Uh, I think they have approval in Switzerland and Australia. You know, let's assume that this legislative initiative was taken on by the government. There's an example where our regulators could actually look at the science that was used in Switzerland and Australia and say, look, we actually believe this represents low risk to our Canadian cattle industry or the public writ large. And we're going to provide a presumptive approval, essentially a provisional registration, and uh, still go through the review, but close that gap. So there is an example. I want to point out there has been some work done on this um, around the margins. For example, uh, there's been, I think it's almost been a decade or more, we've been trying to amend the feed regulations to allow this concept of using foreign jurisdiction decisions to help inform our own regulatory process. So part of the press conference that I held yesterday, uh, Kelvin, was with a number of agriculture stakeholders. And the first step is we said, let's actually gazette 
Canada Gazette number two, the feed regulations that have been kind of lamenting for 10 years. Uh, and then let's build upon that. Let's really kick the door wide open here and use the, that type of thinking to actually put a legislative uh, frame in, in place. Yeah, and, and farm groups stepping up to support as well. We got the Canadian Federation of Agriculture, Grain Growers of Canada, CCGA, CCA, National Cattle Feeders Association, to uh, to name a few. Uh, so there is definitely support here from the agricultural community. Uh, Lindsay, question for Cody. Yeah, so I mean, as a sheep producer, I get a little excited that we might actually be able to have more than, you know, two products approved for sheep uh, used in Canada. Imagine that. I mean, the Canadian flock is a rounding error to Australia. So um, certainly get excited on that on that front. But um, we do have something like the minor use program. We have emergency registrations. Would this be, uh, it sounds like it would be unique. Would this be faster than even the emergency use registration for some products? So, look, it's, uh, I, I don't know the, I'll be completely honest as a parliamentarian, I don't know the ins and outs uh, of every single element of our regulatory agencies, but it's looking to build upon the existing elements that we already have in place. So, uh, we're not trying to take away from anything that's already there. We're trying to say, let's use the science of other jurisdictions to to expedite this. And and I wanted to take the point that you mentioned, the only the two products that are available in the sheep. If you talk to farmers or you talk to particularly the companies that are producing seeds or feeds or crop protection products, what they will tell you uh, is that, well, Canada, of course, we're, we're a large agricultural power. We're relatively small in a market sense. And mm -hmm. so if you think the process is going to be too cumbersome to get the regulatory approval in Canada, you might not just spend the money and you might not actually get it. So sometimes farmers are talking about, well, look, this tool is available in another country. Why can't we get it here? Well, the actual applicant hasn't applied to Canada. And so if there was a bit of an expedited pathway that would allow uh, companies to actually want to register in Canada more easily without compromising public safety or science, uh, I think this might allow for more products to be available without compromising the good work of our regulators. That seems to make some sense. Uh, Tyler, you're up. Yeah, so so first, if Lindsay thinks it's tough in the sheep world, we have goats at home, and they're even harder to find products for than, than the sheep folks do. But, but Cody, I, I think you've got a bit of a track record now, right, of being the kind of the voice of reason for agriculture in Ottawa. You did this a couple of years ago with agriculture and food as a superpower. I think that that was very well received. I think that this is a pretty pragmatic solution. But part of the reason this solution is needed is because things like changes to the feed regulations have dragged on for literally 20 years that they've been talking about it in that case. I'm, I'm curious as to, again, your, your government colleagues, are they supportive? Do you see that this being championed? And, and um, you know, do you have other thoughts or other ideas of things that we can do in the same vein to kind of shake some of these things loose in, inside Ottawa? Oh, my goodness, Sean, I hope you're going to have to keep me on for another panel, because uh, I think there's a ton of low, um, no pun intended, low hanging fruit uh, in the agriculture sector on non cost measures. And, you know, I had a conversation with Scott Ross the other day, the executive director of CFA. And I said, you know, we're in an environment right now where there's not a whole lot, uh, frankly, on the fiscal framework, uh, there's challenges. Uh, and frankly, uh, Minister Freeland has been signaling that uh, she wants to try to make sure that we're mindful of spending in the days ahead message I fully support. I think probably a lot of farmers across the country would agree. But at the same time, if we're going to do that, that's great. But we should also be very open to things of legislative and policy changes that don't cost a single cent that can lead to competitiveness. And this is a red meat issue, I think, for the Canadian agriculture sector. I want to address your point, though, about uh, support amongst my government colleagues. Look, I've, I've talked to Minister McCauley about this, along with Minister Holland. There's definitely interest. Um, but I didn't want that to be a backdoor conversation forever. It's kind of been lurking for a few months. And I went, you know what? I'm going to present the bill. I'm going to drive the initiative. I'll draw attention to it. And hopefully the government uh, will uptake this in its own economic legislation. So, Sean, for your listeners, for the benefit, this is a private member's bill. Uh, there's only so much time allocated to private members' bills. So my concern is even though the initiative is in my name, there might not be enough time to debate it and get fully through Parliament. So I'm just simply saying, here's the initiative. Government, please take this on because, look, as you can see, industry wants this. Farmers are looking for this. People are saying this makes sense without compromising public uh, safety. Uh, I have had a conversation with uh, John Barlow, the shadow minister for the Conservatives. Uh, you know Whether or not he seconds it or at least kind of talks positively about it in the House, I would really appreciate that. I've talked to Alistair McGregor and Yves Parron. So hopefully this can be a multi-partisan effort to say, look, this is just good thinking and let's let's try to move on with it. 
Well, uh, great stuff. Is like I said, it seems like common sense, and I have never understood. It, it, you know, we've been talking about products, but I, I think about varieties and the testing requirements and the variety registration system. And t- I know Tyler has spent a lot of time on this file as well, where we do not take into consideration Canadian or U.S. data because we need Canadian data. It, it is a disadvantage to our producers in Canada. T- Tyler, is that am I describing that fair enough? Yeah, well, I think I think that there's a difference between you know companies needing to demonstrate that products work for farmers, right? I think that that's always going to be in a manufacturer's interest, whether or not you're making drugs or or new plant varieties, to be able to demonstrate that it works and it works for farmers here in Canada. And these regulatory barriers that keep products off the shelves or or out of the bins, or you know, I, I think that we really need to to do a better job of understanding. There's a role of the marketplace to do its job and, and kind of the checks and balances there. And there's a role of, of, you know, producer groups and others to make sure that we're investing in this kind of the research, the evidence. And then there's a separate role for government and regulations. And we need to, I think, be a lot smarter about what that role that we're putting on government and sustainability. Yeah. Okay, let's take a break. Uh, Cody's going to stay with us for another segment. We're going to talk about 234 and some of the drama that unfolded yesterday in the Senate. The U.S. doesn't have all of the political drama. We, we've got our own here in Canada, and we're going to talk about when we come back. You're listening to Real Ag Radio. It's the Real Ag Issues panel here on Rural Radio 147, Sirius XM. What's next for your fields? At Pioneer, delivering industry-leading genetics drives everything we do. From the scientists in the lab to our local teams with boots on the ground, we are determined to get there first. Developing top-performing products, proven in more growing conditions than ever before. Pioneer. What's next happens here. Visit pioneer.com slash Canada to learn more. You know, there's a reason we call it the corn school. Videos on everything from planter setup, weed control, field trial results, yield strategies, and so much more. The Corn School on realagriculture.com has the information and advice you need to help you succeed. Brought to you by Pride Seeds and BSF, Corn School episodes are available at cornschool.com, from realagriculture.com, or as a podcast from your favorite streaming service. Download the latest podcast today. Your co-op grow team are your local experts because we live here too. Our agronomic specialists stay up to date with the latest research and technology to help support your entire farm operation. Talk to our team for advice tailored to your farm's needs. We have recommendations to help you optimize your crop yield and quality while enhancing the health of your land. Co-op, we're all growing together. Here for your farm, here for your family. Learn more at coop.crs farm. And we are back here on Real Ag Radio for the Real Ag Issues panel. We are stacked with issues and panelists. We got Tyler McCann from Cappy. We got uh, Mr. Cody Blois, M- Liberal MP from Kings Haunts, also chair of the House Ag Committee. Kelvin Hepner and Lindsay Smith of Real Agriculture. Kelvin, uh, Bill Two Thirty Four found a bit of a home yesterday in the Senate. Uh, do we have? Give us an update. It was it was it was quite the discussion, and we have an amendment. Uh, give us an update here and we can break it all down. Yeah, this is the bill that would remove the federal carbon tax from propane and natural gas used on farms. So grain drying, barn heating, those types of uh, practices or, or activities. And uh, it's been a long time coming. There was some hope that it would pass in June before the summer break. And it, there was some stuff that happened, gamesmanship in the Senate then that uh, delayed it to fall. And uh, the Senate Agriculture and Forestry Committee has been reviewing it over the last few weeks, hearing from witnesses. And this week, they uh, started their clause by clause approval process of uh, of the bill. And yesterday, we saw Senator Pierre Delfond, who has been the the critic of the bill in the Senate, the lead critic. Uh, he introduced a major amendment to the legislation that would remove uh, the exemption for the heating or cooling of buildings such as barns. Grain drying would still be exempt from the carbon tax if uh, if this amendment is upheld. But uh, as it stands currently, the, the Senate Ag Committee voted in favor of this amendment. And there was a bit of a surprise there, I believe, as Alberta Senator Paula Simons was an early supporter of uh, this private member's bill. 
and she voted in favor of the amendment yesterday. If she hadn't, there would have been a tie, and uh, the committee chair, Rob Black, uh, well known here on on Real Life Radio as well, uh, he's a proponent of the bill, and he would have broken the tie in in favor. And so, the question is, what happens now? The clause by clause consideration of the bill is expected to continue next week. And so at some point, it's going to have to be reported back to the Senate and Senator Black is going to have to report it. And there's a chance at that stage that uh, the Senate doesn't accept the recommendations for the amendment from the the committee. So we're getting into the weeds here. There's also the chance that if the amendment is allowed to proceed, then this bill has changed and would have to go back to where Cody works in the House of Commons and MPs would then have to uh, again vote on this amended bill and they could reject the amendment and you'd have this back and forth struggle uh, that we've seen on the rare occasion between the House of Commons and the Senate. And usually, especially with a private member's bill, the, the House of Commons, the Senate won't get in the way of the House of Commons ultimately. So the overall effect here is that it looks like it's going to further delay implementation of the bill as we are uh, in the middle of a, a grain drying season here in Western Canada, getting into it in Ontario and yeah. barn heating season is around the corner too. And there was some hopes that uh, this legislation would be in effect for, uh, for this upcoming uh, round of, uh, of propane and natural gas bills. Well, if, if buildings are excluded, Lindsay, you made the comment because we, we were talking about the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Mm-hmm. They put out a release. Uh, this uh, building amendment seems a little bit anti-livestock. So, first of all, I think senators need a hobby. They seem to be getting way too into this. Like, come on. I thought this was a rubber stamp. No, I'm just kidding. It is sober second thought. This is what the Senate is supposed to do to a point. Um, but I'd really love to know. I, I did watch a couple of clips, but... What convinced the senators to to want to approve this amendment that would take heating and cooling out? Because realistically, what are we heating and cooling for? Uh, we're talking about our hog barns, our our poultry operations, um, our dairy barns. That to me, it just I, I'm trying not to wear my cynical pants today, but I'm tired. I'm cranky. I'm cynical, and it feels very anti last. I love cranky Lindsay. <laughs> I have a lot of fun at little party. sandpaper. It's good for everybody. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to play you a clip. This was from yesterday. Senator Michael McDonald, who I believe is from Nova Scotia. Uh, this is what he said. And there was a, a number of comments in this vicinity, in this context. Here's what he had to say. I mean, we've got to get practical here. We've got to be realistic in what we're dealing with. And again, both the Green Party and the NDP supported this. So it's not a, it's not a partisan you know, it's not a partisan initiative. So I think we have to get away from the partisan stuff and, and deal with the issue, which is helping farmers survive in this environment, this, this 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 economic environment. We know how much food is costing in this country. And now we want, to, if you're going to add to the cost of running a farm, you're going to add to the cost of food. And it's, it's we're going down the wrong road. What are your thoughts when you hear that, Cody? Uh, look, I agree. Uh, and it's not just uh, supported by the NDP, Greens, Bloc, Conservatives. It's also three members of Parliament from the Liberal side. Uh, I was one of them, along with Heath McDonald and Bobby Morrissey. Um, so, you know, complete support from every party in the House of Commons. Uh, I was disappointed uh, to see the fact that the committee, uh, to your point, Kelvin, uh, at least in, in principle, the report stage hasn't gone back to the Senate, but has removed what I thought was the key essence of the bill, right? I mean, grain drying, extremely important part. No one would disagree. But Lindsay, to your point, uh, the actual key crux was also on the uh, barn heating as well. Um, and again, I when you have Elizabeth May, who is certainly characterized in the parliament as one of the most environmentally mindful members of parliament voting for this, uh, I would agree with Senator McDonald on that. Um, and, you know, to have, I, I don't want to play the urban rural bit, but to have two senators uh, in Senator Wu from downtown Vancouver and Senator Dalvon from downtown Montreal, uh, this is the most popular private members bill in rural Canada. Uh, and it matters. And I would agree, it's not going to solve food price inflation, it's not going to solve all the challenges on farm, but it is a step, I think, in the right direction. And it's sunset, too. We're not saying this is forever. We want to, inc- we want to continue to encourage innovation on farm. We know farmers are on board with that, but it's a step in the right direction in the interim. And uh, I will be doing everything I can if it does come back to the host to make sure that the majority of MPs that voted for this would also not accept the Senate amendments, because what can happen is the Senate can say, great, we want to amend it. If Ben Lobb stands up and moves a motion to say, let's not accept the Senate amendments, we can push it back to the Senate, at which point, on a presidential basis, the Senate should acquiesce and say, OK, it goes through. 
So we'll see what happens. But um, I was I was disappointed. In fact, John Barrow and I actually wrote a joint letter to the committee this week, basically saying, please really weigh the idea of any amendments versus how crucial it is to actually expedite this bill. As you mentioned, Calvin, we were hoping that this might get through before even we get to this point. Tyler, what's your thoughts on what's motivating some of the senators to, you know, to really have issue with this bill as as written and push for some of these amendments? Sean, it's hard to predict the motivations of senators some days. I think you know, you've got to be careful what you ask for with an, an independent Senate. It worked in agriculture's favor with rail amendments a couple of years ago. We would not have got the rail amendments that we did with C49 had it not been for some senators using that independent power. But Again, it, it, it's a little, keep in mind, so the, the amendment exempting uh, barn heating did pass. There was one to shorten the time frame as well. It, it ended up failing, and, and it sounds like there's some more amendments coming next week. So there are quite a series of, of, of attacks to this bill that are being driven um, by, by senators. And, you know, it, it's a, I think it's an unfortunate. I think it represents probably a, not a very good understanding of what the issue is kind of what the ability, what the impact of, of the price of carbon is on this, what the alternatives are or aren't that, that farmers can use. Um, and, and at the end of the day, I think it just, again, reflects some of the, the lack of an understanding of what's actually going on in rural Canada. I think it I think it's worth noting. I mean, Cody, Cody talked about the, the Liberal MPs that voted for it. I think they reflects the common sense coming out of Atlantic Canada. And I think that the world probably could use some, some more of that, Cody. So I don't don't know how we, we spread some of that Atlantic Canadian wisdom around more, more places. Atlantic Canada pixie dust. We need, we need to put that into a jar and spread it the, around. The well, common I, sense capital of Canada. I, <laughs> I want to, Sean, I just want to build upon it. Cause again, look, this is a live discussion, Atlantic Canada. If you've been watching the headlines outside of agriculture, you have a number of liberal members of parliament calling on adjustments to the federal backstop. And you know, I, I fully believe in a carbon price. I'll, I'll be completely transparent. I do think it's a right mechanism. There's a question about whether you go at a mission trading level, at a higher industrial level, versus how far you put that price signal down. And part of what we're talking about on amendments is uh, you have to have an ability to change. And in some cases, there is, and this price signal actually helps to justify and reinforce investments. Uh, grain drying and even on barn heating, there's difficulty in doing that uh, in many instances. That's not to say that the technology is not coming or that there's going to be cost-effective ways to transition. But in the interim, I think this bill was a reasonable step to sunset it. We're saying not forever, uh, but we want to make sure that we're not uh, putting a price signal that is punishing in this instance. And when you've got a majority of members of the House of Commons saying that that's the direction you want to go, um, it was it was a bit disappointing uh, to see the Senate uh, do what it did, but we'll see what happens. And if it does come back to the House, my hope is that a majority of MPs will actually reject the amendments and send it back for royal assent. Hey, Tyler, I know you wanted to hit on food prices and talk to Cody about some of that. Yeah, so, so just quickly, Cody, I'm, I'm curious as to kind of where you see this this kind of these efforts by Minister Champagne and others to drive food prices down going, because it seems like pretty quickly it's going to collide into the reality that for grocery stores to to stabilize or lower food prices, that's going to have impacts on the rest of the value chain. And so on one side, we've got Agriculture Canada leading a sustainable ag strategy that's probably going to put extra pressure, extra costs on the food system, drive prices up. On the other side, we've got Minister Champagne telling the grocery retailers drive prices down. And really, they're just going to turn around and tell that to everybody else in the in the food system. Kind of where do you see that going? And and how is this going to play out? Is it is it going to be, do we want more affordable food, more sustainable food? Or, or how, how do we square that circle boy give me enough time sean to answer this one so um look a uh, couple things i think the government is rightfully responding to the affordability challenges right we came out of london as a caucus and you heard the government talking a lot about housing which is a top of mind issue right now uh when you think about other pressures it's uh food affordability and just affordability writ large so i don't think there's anything intrinsically wrong with drawing attention to food affordability but it becomes a very holistic conversation because it's a nuanced question. You were before my committee, Tyler, uh, talking about this issue. A uh, couple things that the government has done is directly out of the report that we did, including one of the recommendations that you had, which was to actually establish a price monitor on food dollars similar to the United States and get Statistics Canada to do so. Um, part of this is also getting um, a consumer affairs division to actually follow grocery prices, because the big question becomes, of course, if you're going to look at trying to find price stability, is who pays for that stability if input costs continue to go higher? Um, 
you know, that's yet to be determined. The we part of the work of the committee over the next couple of weeks and months is actually going to be re-examining this. I, I, I will tell you that we passed a motion yesterday in camera to re-engage on this issue. And part of the question is going to be inviting all elements of the supply chain to say, uh, we got to make sure that if we are trying to find that stability, that it's not coming at the downstream cost to farmers or um, kind of small processors. Uh, Minister Champagne was very clear in that, but the question becomes still, how do retailers go about getting that price stability without just kind of putting a hammer? Who actually pays for that? And that's an open question right now. I actually, for what it's worth, think there's a broader conversation that we can have around, okay, how do we find stability to try to help make sure we're making a difference in the short term? Uh, and then how do we have a broader conversation about the health of the agri-food sector in Canada for longer term results? Um, and uh, we'll see where that goes. But I think it's an important question right now. And that's what I said to some of the food processors as they came in. Uh, you should be trying to want to work and find efficiencies. But at the same time, let's open the door to a bigger conversation about competitiveness in the agriculture sector writ large. Any last questions for Cody before uh, he has to head on his way? Kelvin or Lindsay? Are you, are you putting your goalie pads on this winter, Cody? <laughs> uh, it's funny. Uh, I do play in a beer league. Uh, I, the goalie pads have been collecting dust because like any good goaltender, when you get to the beer leagues, you look around and say it's way more fun to get out and skate. So actually, I was teasing John Barlow saying I want to light him up. The Conservatives have a little bit of a skate in Ottawa, but they don't want to invite me out. So uh, uh, I will be on the ice and uh, maybe we'll see you around if we get uh, get the chance to connect. That that'd be really good. Like in the U.S., uh, the House of Representatives has the Democrats versus Republican baseball game at uh, where the hockey. Nationals play. We we should do a hockey tournament in in Canada. That'd be good. I like the idea. So, so I want to know where do we sign up for the Cody for Leader campaign when the opportunity is <laughs> sounds like lots of common sense there, Cody. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, no we. Comment. Really- we, we, <laughs> we'll start it here. <laughs> this is the part where we get him in trouble. Uh, yeah. You know what, uh, Cody, we really appreciate you joining us. Um, you, I, I know you frequently listen to the program, and it's great that you uh, – I know you're super busy in a week like this, but to giving us some of your time to break this down for the Real Agriculture audience, we greatly appreciate it. So thanks so much. Thanks for all that you guys do, guys. Have a great uh, weekend. We'll be right back on Real Ag Radio right after this. CDC Endure is a new oat line from Alliance Seed. High yielding with excellent disease resistance and the quality end users ask for all in one great oat variety. CDC Endure provides the high beta-glucan levels to make heart healthy products like breakfast cereals. For more information on CDC Endure oats as well as any other products from Alliance Seed, check out allianceseed.com or visit any Alliance Seed authorized retailers. What were the issues in your fields this year? Did you do a soil sample? What is your soil sample telling you about some of the nutrient issues that you might be having going into next year? What herbicides did you use? What residues might you might be concerned about? What weed issues did you have? What crop residues did you have? How well do you know your fields? Get the answers to all the questions you have about your pulse crop at the Pulse School on realagriculture.com. Back to Real Ag Radio, Real Ag Issues Panel. We got Lindsay Smith and Kelvin Hepner of Real Agriculture, and we are joined today by Tyler McCann, Managing Director of Cappy. Lindsay, do you like imitator products? Because I sure don't. No. I don't either. Uh-uh. Not. No way. Imitator, imitator stabilizer products claim dual protection, but do they actually deliver? Hmm, I don't think so. Defend your UAN from nitrogen loss with Tribune Nitrogen Stabilizer from Coke Agronomic Services, offering superior above and below ground protection. See how others stack up at defendyourn.ca. Okay, we got a bunch of topics here to rattle through. Uh, Kelvin, uh, Egger Recovery. We finally have an announcement. It's It's like Feels like it's taken a long time, but uh, we're finally here. Yeah, we're not sure exactly what caused this latest delay. It sounds like it probably was related to the Prime Minister's office approving the the federal funding here. Agri Recovery, of course, is a federal provincial uh, cost shared program, and uh, this is they've signaled been signaling since August that they're going to be rolling out Agri Recovery of some form for livestock producers affected by the drought in Alberta and Saskatchewan. BC had also applied. And right now we don't have the details right in front of us yet, but the announcement is happening today from what we're told. And uh, and so uh, 
it's unclear whether the actual program details are, are going to be shared today or just the dollar commitments from the provinces and the federal government. And it sounds like it all came together really last minute because there wasn't even time for uh, federal ag minister Lawrence McCauley to get on a plane out West for, uh, for the announcement today. So uh, yeah, not sure, but it's come together quite quickly at the end here after weeks of, uh, of delays and false starts. Yeah. We had multiple sources telling us this kind of really came together on Wednesday late in the day. So, uh, and, and less, it sounds like less money than was originally requested. Yes. Yeah. The original announcement that was, we were told there was supposed to be an announcement two weeks ago now, or a week and a half ago. Tuesday after the Thanksgiving. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that, that day came and went and it sounds like the dollar figure maybe was part of why the delay happened because the dollar that amount we're hearing today isn't the same as what it was uh, at that time. Mm -hmm. It should not be a surprise to anybody today that there are droughts that are going to happen across Canada. Extreme weather is the new reality. We have had agri recovery as our so-called disaster program for uh, 15 years. Now, the fact that we have not figured out how to put meaningful systems that are timely and responsive to things that are all too unfortunately predictable today is a huge disappointment and it should be an unacceptable situation for Canadian agriculture and food. There should be no reason why we do not have a predictable, predetermined framework in place for situations like this. This is not, again, not unusual. What is, I suppose, unfortunately very usual is government is slow. Government doesn't work as well as it used to. A lot of people would say government's broken. I'm not sure it's not there, but it sure as heck doesn't work the way that it should. And 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 we do too much accepting of, you know, this is just the unfortunate reality. We need to do more standing up and saying this is an unacceptable situation and governments of both levels, this is an FPT situation, need to be held account for the fact that we need a predictable, effective disaster framework in Canada, and we do not have one today. Mm-hmm. Yeah, especially for livestock, said, yeah. especially on the livestock and feed side of things. Yeah, 100 percent I'm so I mean a few things. Realistically, you know, if you think about how often agro recovery has been triggered just in the last five years right um and then you look at okay so then it's going to take potentially this long and with less money to tyler's point should we not at some point be sitting back and saying this doesn't work this isn't a functioning uh you know program and perhaps we have to be looking two steps back but i mean we've heard from from producers that if they want to continue to have you know cattle on the landscape and and that's a vital part of keeping our grasslands healthy and that that ecosystem thriving. It has to be you have to have risk management tools that can keep cattle going on that landscape or else you may as well just tear it up and put in crops. And I don't think that's what we want here, guys. So yeah, the, the solution should be actually to make agri stability work, right? It is a margin based yeah. program that should be there that should be able to respond when farmers are facing these excess pressures on on costs or on revenue. The, that's what the program should do. Again, it really doesn't. The stopgap of agro recovery should be able to get figured out. If, right. you look at the US, if you look at the Australia, there are examples of how you put in, in place a predictable drought program. Canada should be able to figure this out. Mm-hmm. Could we call it an advance on agro stability? I know Stuart Person at M- MNP has sort of looks at it that way. referred to yeah. agro recovery as as being an advance on what would you what you would be getting through agro stability a year down the road kind of thing. But that yeah. doesn't, to me though, that just speaks to then it's not working as it's supposed to, right? Like I agree, it means that agri stability, a lot of people think, well, it should protect like a drop in income. It doesn't, it protects when you lose, you actually make no money. That's not necessarily what we're talking about here per se, because of all the other things as a as a livestock producer you're gonna do to try to keep going. Right. And and so like there's those questions about, well, can we have tax deferrals in years where we have to shrink the herd and go back? And those are ad hoc there and and then by only certain areas or whatever the case may be. So why don't we have a more, um, you know, fulsome list of tools that livestock producers can use to adapt to the to situations like this that don't necessarily hurt them in the long term? I don't think we have that suite of programs right now so i was listening to another another podcast uh out of the united states talking about a new insurance product that they're offering for cow calf producers again they have a model that encourages innovation that encourages 
different products to come to market that leverages the private sector and delivering them, that encourages new ideas to co come forward. And not only do we not have that in Canada, like even what we have just doesn't work. And and I think part of the problem is that farm groups in particular have got just got tired of being told no anytime they try and ask for a change to the BRM suite. But like this really is, this is not, should not be an acceptable situation for anyone to be in. Like we're, again, this drought, we knew it was, you know that these things are coming now. Like this is now, if we know every couple of years, it's the reality that we're going to be in. Governments should be, they should know what they're going to do in the, in the recovery program that comes out of it. They should have mechanisms in place. They know governments have to work together. If we cannot figure out how to turn this around more quickly, they really do think it speaks to much more fundamental problems with how our risk management programs work. Just, just quickly, if I can jump in, Lindsay used the term anti-livestock sentiment, I believe, earlier in the in the show, and I don't really like to discuss this. I, I hope it's not true, but Tyler, do you think that there's some of that when it comes to policy around the livestock herd and, and viability of it in the long term, in, in especially in yeah areas that are suffering from yeah. drought? Not probably not in this case, Kelvin. I think. You know what is Good. the old saying? Like, don't don't blame uh, on on conspiracy. What you can blame on incompetence. I think, like, I think just government just doesn't work well anymore. Like, I think I think that that's probably the biggest uh, point on this. You know, the, the, I think that there is a desire to potentially, you know, as part of an effort to have a more sustainable agriculture, lower our methane emissions. And the only really way you could do that is by having fewer cows. I mean, that that really is kind of what it comes down to at the end of the day. But I don't. I don't. I would be skeptical that that's what's playing into this case. I think we just have a terrible program framework. I I would love to know why there's a gap. Like if it's the provinces, unless the provinces were doing the, we're going to ask for X. We really need Y, and they got Y. But I I guess I'll take them at their word. You know, they said they needed X. Yeah, why? But think, why is think, it underfunded? I think if you go back, Sean, and look at the history of agro recovery. Um, usually the payouts are far lower than what they actually announced amounts are for a whole bunch of reasons I mean, that that would not this would not be the first time that right. governments can announce 100 million dollars and only spend 20 again it does play into i think the reality that it is an advance on agro recovery or on agro stability and you know things get delayed <laughs> so late that by the time you're actually going to get your agro recovery payment you might as well just get your agro stability payment instead like there's a whole bunch of reasons why they tend to underspend yeah some of that may be, be playing playing into it, but the whole point of, of this was to try and take the politics out of it and to make it a more kind of predictable framework. And that's all getting getting worse rather than getting better. Well, and and I, I have not talked to people in BC. I have heard from BC, some BC listeners. Uh, we appreciate you listening. Very, you know, the, uh, very upset about how long this has taken in some of those areas of British Columbia. Both Alberta and Saskatchewan sources around the government told us that, hey, we're ready with the money. We're just waiting for the PMO's office. Uh, and and the, the fact that this took so long is and at a time where regional meetings are happening, like in producers are getting together. They want to know the program like it's I don't know. It just I agree with uh, the panel sentiment here. OK, let's take a break. We've got to talk about whether or not. The CDC is going to comply with a request from the DFC not to uh, load you with too many acronyms. What's going to happen with the price of milk going forward, basically, is what I'm asking. And we'll get to that when we come back. You're listening to Real Life Radio, Rural Radio 147. At Brett Young, we focus on what's real. It's how we became Canada's largest independent seed company. That's why we're asking a real farmer, what do you think of BY6217TF, Brett Young's TrueFlex Canola Hot? What's that? <clears throat> BY6217TF, Brett Young's TrueFlex Canola Hybrid with Pod Defender Shatter Reduction Technology and Defender Rated Club Root and Black Leg Resistance. Uh, good yield, yeah. Probably choose it again. Thanks, Chris. Talk to your Brett Young retailer today to see for yourself. Brett Young, distinct by design. What's next for your fields? At Pioneer, delivering industry-leading genetics drives everything we do. From the scientists in the lab to our local teams with boots on the ground. We are determined to get there first. Developing top performing products, proven in more growing conditions than ever before. Pioneer, what's next happens here. Visit pioneer.com slash Canada to learn more. And 
Welcome back to Real Egg Radio here for the Real Egg Issue Panel. Lindsay Smith, Kelvin Hepner of Real Agriculture, and the managing director of CAPI is Tyler McCann. Lindsay, we got a big agronomist show on Monday night. We're talking spot spring. That's going to be fun. Yeah, I'm so excited. So, uh, yeah, so Tom Nozzle Guy Wolf and Carl DeConnick Smith, uh, farmer out of Saskatchewan, are going to join me Monday night, 8 p.m. Eastern, live on the Agronomist. And yeah, we're going to talk. Spot spring, so green on green tech, um, and the economics of it. So does it save you money? And if it does, where do you put that money? So super cool. Both uh, We've had Carl on the Canola School talking about it. Tom, of course, regular on, on uh, Real Agriculture. we got lots to dig into, so I'm excited. That's going to be fun. You can watch mm-hmm. it on the Real Agriculture YouTube channel or go to realagriculture.com slash live, 8 o'clock Eastern, 6 o'clock Mountain. It is Real Ag in prime time, hosted by Lindsay Smith. And you can watch that, then switch to Monday Night Football. It's like the perfect Monday night. It's it, right. They go together like ham and cheese. Okay, uh, I alluded to this, uh, or beer and pretzels, or 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 whatever fits better. I like the cheese one. It fits good with what we're going to segue to here. So, yeah, well, it, the question is, will the price of cheese be going up in Canada? As the dairy farmers of Canada have requested that the CDC basically take a pause on future price hikes. I guess till, uh, they have to make a decision by November 1st for the February price hike, I believe. Kelvin, that is, I got all those facts straight. Yeah, that's right. It's an annual process. The Dairy Commission reviews cost of production da- data from dairy farmers across the country and then uh, sets uh, the price for February 1st of the next year. This is the farm gate milk price, of course, not the milk price in the grocery store. There's all kinds of other factors that go into that. But uh, the independent grocers have uh, filed uh, an exceptional circumstances clause or they've invoked that clause. And so now the Dairy Commission is actually uh, going through a bit of a special process here. Uh, where they're calling all the stakeholders together over the next few days. And like you said, by November 1st, they are expected to come up with a decision on how much uh, of an increase they're going to apply in light of inflation, of input costs still going up and all of those types of things. But like you said, Dairy Farmers of Canada, noteworthy, uh, asked for uh, the CDC to hold off on any increase uh, on February 1st. So uh, certainly counter to dairy farmers short-term interests but i think in the broader public long-term opinion uh, that's where dairy farmers are concerned about uh, continuing to uh, have higher milk prices in the store and the impact that could have on canadians but aren't they kind of caught here it's, it's sort of like we were talking earlier about either you believe in science or you don't believe in science either you believe in the math or you don't believe in the math it, so if they pause we just don't all of a sudden believe in the math because of public pressure tyler like they're kind of caught here are they not Well, and and again, this is the blessing and curse of a regulated marketplace with regulated pricing structures, right? It it is, yeah, it should kind of live and die by the results of that. I think it does reflect kind of this extraordinary dynamic, this world that we're in. It really is important to to remember the point that Calvin made that that this is not retail price. and, and, And regardless of whatever decision gets made by the Dairy Commission, the price that consumers have to pay is is going to be different. And it's not going to follow the same logic, but I think it does show that that dairy farmers have heard the message. They're aware of the concerns that consumers have, and they're they're responding and trying to be proactive. But it does speak to the kind of the the challenges that come with the pricing formula. I I think that there's been a lot of extra pressure, a lot of attention paid to it. I think that there's a lot of um, expectation around more transparency around how how do these pricing decisions take into account, and uh, and it's going to be interesting to see what the long term future is is for that. Yeah, it is, it is worth noting the price of milk or at at Farmgate has not kept is, the inflate rate of inflation there has not nearly been as high as the rest of the food basket or or the rest of the economy in terms of inflation. So, it, it while milk prices have gone up and supply management is often a, a target when it comes to discussions around food pricing in in Canada, uh, that those price increases haven't been as high as the rate of inflation on other food products. And, and it, the price does go down sometimes, 2017, 2018, they actually did lower the price. Right? So, you know, that p- people will lose sight of that whenever they got, get caught up when they see big, big price increases coming along. Lindsay, this week we saw Manitoba Premier Wab Canoe sworn in, named his cabinet, and uh, which is kind of like a trend. What's old is new again, similar to the federal ag minister, where we saw 2.0. For Lawrence McCauley, we've got Ron Kostitian 2.0. Back in the seat. So I got to, yeah, so Ron Kostitian, he's uh, 
he's an MLA from the Dauphin area, I believe, um, was the, the provincial ag minister before and is now going to reclaim uh, that role for Manitoban. So I, I do have to sort of, I, I have to wonder, is the agriculture minister pool this shallow at a federal and provincial level? Um, you know, formerly of Manitoba, I would say we've usually had some good options, but it does kind of feel like he kind of was the only real contender. And Kelvin, I mean, that's your home province. Was he the only contender, really? Well, okay, but I want to, it, it, some like right. so we, we had Cody Blois on here earlier. Clearly, he yes. would be a contender to be the federal ag minister. I but know this is what I, I'm as saying. We heard too much of a tree shaker, I think, and mm. I think it's what do we want out of our ag minister is maybe the question that should be attached. Well, what, to that well, what the parties want out of yeah, exactly ag minister, apparently yeah, not the yeah. Yeah, not not farmers. It's, what, it's what the, the party does. Yeah, I, exactly. I think I think in, in Manitoba's case, even farmers are they, probably okay the with goal, it. Like you said, was so shallow. Ron Kostichin is really the only NDP MLA. So the NDP won the election. He's really the only MLA with a significant agricultural presence in his constituency. There was one other candidate as uh, an MLA from downtown Winnipeg, used to work for Manitoba Agriculture for the Provincial Agriculture Department and has some good good relationships. But really, Kostichin was the only option. And I think from a farmer's perspective, I, I, I do think that farmers in like most farming parts of Manitoba did not and have never voted NDP. I think people were okay with Kostitian's reappointment to the post over other people because he won't be an activist in terms of uh, pushing aggressive policies that uh, people from downtown Winnipeg might like to see. Uh, I'm not sure how much sway he'll have in terms of countering them in, in cabinet. That's yet to be seen. I don't really know what his mandate will be because this government has a lot of focus on health care and education and other parts of uh, provincial jurisdiction. I'm not sure how much we'll see in terms of movement and new ideas on the agriculture file here. Well, and speaking of mandate letters, Tyler, we still have not seen the mandate letters for the federal ministers, so I'm not exactly sure what uh, they're up to either. Well, that's a really good question. Uh, they're not moving agri-recovery agri forward very quickly. The agriculture minister is not too engaged on food price inflation, apparently. Hard to maybe fully understand what, what those priorities are. And for for a government, a federal government that was so uh, anxious about having a change coming out of their cabinet shuffle, again, it seems like the follow through has been a little bit lacking. But again, I think I think that we have this kind of era. It's probably true in with the NDP in Manitoba and the federal Liberals today, where people think that you know a Liberal agriculture minister is not going to have a lot of weight, and NDP agriculture minister is not going to have a lot of weight. But you go back to uh, Roseanne Wauchuk, uh, who was there before Kostichin the last time. She was an agriculture minister that had had influence. There were kind of a long line of liberal agriculture ministers that had influence too. I think I think that we we forget that just because they're a liberal or NDP doesn't necessarily mean or didn't used to mean that the agriculture minister didn't have any power. I think yeah. a lot of a lot of things have changed. In, in, in some ways, I actually find the NDP. I know from a media perspective, in terms of doing interviews, they're easier to get. It's some sometimes easier to get interviews with NDP agriculture ministers than with progressive conservative agriculture ministers because they're too close to the agriculture community in in some cases. And so, the NDP have an interest in in reaching out and building relationships and bridges and those types of things. So, not sure what that means in terms of actual policy implementation, but yeah, sometimes there's more openness to discussions with parties that aren't conventionally seen as closely aligned with with the agriculture community. If I had a horn, I'd have to blow it because we're out of time. That's the end of the game here, folks. Uh, I have to call it a, a draw. You all did fantastic. Uh, I really appreciate it. Great opinions. Great. You get to break the tie as the chair, as yeah. Senator Black could have, could have done on the <laughs> urban tax. But, but didn't get a chance. Yeah. Man, I just get back to all the common sense we heard from Cody Boyce earlier. Okay. Uh, Lindsay, have yourself a great weekend. All of you as well. Her senators are off to a great start, everybody. Yeah, they are. Very pleased with that. Also, uh, Kelvin, enjoy yourself. Thank you. Everyone have a good weekend. Everybody check out. Uh, Kelvin's going to have an interview with uh, Alberta Ag Minister R.J. Sigurdsson about the egg recovery over the weekend here. Uh, Tyler, thanks a lot for joining us. Great perspective. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Sean. Okay, if you have any feedback on today's show, you can send me an email, shaney at realagriculture.com, or, of course, call that Real Ag feedback line, 855-776-6147. Everybody, enjoy your weekend, and we'll chat with you next week. Thanks so much for getting real and getting connected with Real Ag Radio. Thank you for downloading this episode of the Real Ag Radio podcast, brought to you by Economics. 
With one-of-a-kind tools, research, and content, economics is farming's go-to information resource. Find it all on nutrient-economics.com or download the app.